good evening everyone and good morning to those joining uh, us from canada and the united states on behalf of the indian police foundation it is my pleasure to welcome every one of you particularly ms uh, beatriz joregi the author of this uh, fascinating book provisional authority and uh, also a warm welcome to shri vapala balachandran and every one of you ladies and gentlemen in the audience i also welcome mr prakash singh our chairman indian police foundation chairman thank you everyone for being here i was just mentioning it was almost about 2 years back that uh, some of us at the indian police foundation had some internal discussions about hosting a conversation around this book but uh, covid-19 pandemic slowed us down i am now particularly grateful to shri nand kumar sarvade who recently took this initiative and got in touch with beatrice and requested her to do this discussion and we are happy and thankful to her that she very graciously accepted the uh, our invitation this book has been described as an eth ethnography of the everyday life and work of police in uttar pradesh but i must say that in many ways this book is not only about uttar pradesh police but about the entire indian police offering some very <coughs> waiting and some very uncomfortable insights into the realities in the world of policing in india what makes this book very different is that a very profoundly intellectual treatise like this is also grippingly readable and absorbing beatrice's uh, metaphors about the chalta hai brand of policing and the indeterminate nature of police authority and how it plays out in the shifting sands of provisionality these metaphors can be somewhat disturbing and even for some of us who are hard hardened policemen now before i hand over the mic to shri balachandra our moderator i would like to briefly introduce the author ms beatrice joregi is associate professor at the university of toronto center for criminology and uh, socio legal studies she teaches courses on policing human rights and security crime gender as well as the uh, she also teaches uh, qualitative research methods professor uh, joregi is co-author of the handbook of global policing and also anthropology and uh, global counter insurgency these are very excellent some of them i happened to i could not read through them but some i was able to see and i was quite impressed and maybe very useful to most of us in the audience here she has also authored numerous chapter contributions and research articles published in several peer reviewed journals she is currently principal investigator on a five year research study titled police unions democratic transformation and social justice this uh, study is funded by the canadian social sciences and humanities research council this is the first transnational and longitudinal study of what uh, according to beatrice herself it is a police worker politics in four countries namely brazil canada india and the united states now coming back to today's event to moderate our discussions we are honored to have 
a very distinguished sec security expert, author and public intellectual and former IPS officer, Sri Vapala Balachandran. And without wasting any more of your time, let me hand over the stage to Mr. Vapala Balachandran to set the ball rolling. Hope we, are, um, we all have a, an interesting and useful discussion ahead. Over to you, Mr. Balachandran. Thank you, Ramchandran. Thank you, my friends. This is my first uh, occasion of uh, attending a seminar to the Police uh, Foundation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very happy that my friend uh, Prakar Singh has taken leading role in the rolling out the police reforms moment in India has also been, I mean, has also found quite inconvenient for me convenient to be present today. And, uh, uh, but for his uh, and his other colleagues, uh, especially Mr. Ramchandran's efforts, the police reform moment would have died down long ago due to the opposition from the, the various state governments and politicians. So I'm, I'm particularly thankful to Prakash and Ramchandran to keep it alive. Small people like me have been writing about the police reforms, but uh, an institutionalized work by both of them and also by other colleagues has uh, found it keeping going and keeping the issue alive. Now, coming back to the book which we are uh, discussing today, uh, I was asked by the Economic and Political Weekly which is a serious magazine and uh, to write a review in uh, 2018. Actually, uh, this, her uh, research was done quite, uh, I mean, early part of the 21st century. And she uh, paid uh, fields, I mean, she came to UP for field studies for about 27 months in 2006 and 2007. So what she describes is not the condition today, but a continuing atmosphere in Uttar Pradesh since quite some time. So what I found very interesting in our, uh, uh, in our book was that it is her empathy. He, unlike many, I don't want to say foreigners, including our own, journalist, it is not fault finding. It's very empathetic. And another most important thing that we have to remember is despite whatever remarks you might have written, which is actually perhaps the uh, Prakash may be able to say much more than me because I not worked in Uttar Pradesh, I worked in Maharashtra. And uh, the most important thing to remember is that UP police gave her excellent cooperation for a field study that she writes it at length. She, why did she choose uh, UP police? Is because it is the largest subnational police force under a unified command in the entire world. That is why she chose UP. In fact, if you compare UP police with uh, the British police, you will find that UP has 2.43 lakhs square kilometers. It is more than a country like uh, UK, including, when, when I say UK, it, is, it includes Scotland and Northern Ireland. These are three different police systems. UP has only one police system. So he, her book describes how the UP police has struggled to undertake this huge responsibility with meager resources balance in citizens' grievances with chronic political interference. So, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the title of the book is Andhra Provision Authority, Police Order and Security in India. Why does she do, do this? She says that the police do their work under an incessantly shifting order However, the police power is not permanent or, or long-term, but only provisional. This he calls provisional authority, which is also the title of the book. I may 
uh, I would like to uh, mention here about a book or rather the three books written by our Willis Elder like C. N. S. Saxena of the 1941 batch of Indian police. He had flagged the huge problems of a large police system like UP police. Mr. Saxena was UP police chief during 70 to 71 and later director general of Central Reserve Police in, from 1974 to 1977. He was also a member of the National Police Commission during 77 and 81. He had written three books on policing, especially how the PAC mutiny on May 23, 1973 was caused by, due to gross political interference and unfair treatment of the provincial armed constabulary. This had led to summoning with the army and the unfortunate deaths of 30 Javans. This had also led to the resignation of then chief minister. I should think that instead of considering the book as, a, as accusatory for sensation, which we find nowadays among the foreign media as well as the media, we should consider it as a useful literature by an impartial observer who had given empathetic account of the trials and tribulations of an overburdened police force, which is trying to balance their legal responsibility with aggressive political interference. This political interference did not start recently, as I said earlier. Also, such candid and impartial accounts do contribute to your literature to police reforms. <laughs> I would now request Dr. Biaris Kavaragi to present her book with my short introduction. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes Please great. Go okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for, for inviting me here. It's really an honor um, to speak with you. Uh, and thank you, um, Palachan Jandri, for the uh, really wonderful introduction um, and also the excellent uh, review of my book and, and very close reading that you've done. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Nandkumar uh, Saravade, who, uh, yes, initially did contact me with the invitation. Uh, I think we had started corresponding after I gave a talk at the IDFC Institute last year. Um, so he really was the one to kind of get this going. And also my thanks, of course, to uh, Ramachandranji and Mr. Prakash Singh. It's good to see you again after many years. Um, so, uh, and thank you to everyone in the audience uh, for coming. Uh, this is a really exciting moment for me because even though this book uh, was first published now five years ago. Um, this is actually the first time that I am formally presenting it to an audience comprised primarily of the people that it is about. Um, so this is always uh, an exciting moment for a researcher to um, <laughs> really hear from, from, uh, from her interlocutors. So I, I won't assume uh, that, uh, that most of you have read the book. Um, and so I just want to say, I welcome all questions and ideas just based on um, Mr. Balachandran's comments and my own. Uh, if you have read the book and come here with questions, uh, I'm also very uh, happy to engage those. And I will, I will try to keep my remarks short, maybe just 15 minutes or so, just to give a kind of brief introduction that will help contextualize it a little bit, um, just give you a sense of what the book aims to do, uh, and also how I approach this, I think, still very fraught question of police authority and police power in India, and how it relates to much broader forces and relations of social order democratic governance and security in the country. Uh, you've already, you heard a few words about um, the fact that, you know, I did choose Uttar Pradesh as my main site. You know, many people, many people ask why Uttar Pradesh? You know, it's, it's not necessarily representative of all of India. Well, of course, you know, in, in, in many ways that's true. 
Um, and as Balachandran Ji mentioned, I, I chose UP quite simply um, because while perhaps, you know, not representative in the sense that things are everywhere the same, which we know they're not, uh, you know, UP is, um, I think, what many people consider a kind of heartland of the nation, uh, home, of course, to many important um, political and religious sites of social life. Um, it is, of course, also characterized by a host of superlatives, for better or worse, um, you know, being the most populous state, as was mentioned, uh, having the most representatives in the Lok Sabha, etc. And well, I just, I had done Hindi and Urdu language immersion programs there. Um, that was actually why I made my first visit to Lucknow in 2004. So a couple of years before I began uh, the long period of field work with uh, the UPP. So um, yeah, so I, I just started there. And when I, I came to Lucknow in 2004, the first time I, I had initially thought about the project that I was going to do, I was a, a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And what I imagined that I was going to do was what um, an anthropologist named Laura Nader, uh, who was actually the sister of Ralph Nader, who ran for president in the US <laughs> some time ago. But she, she had this idea of, of studying up since traditionally anthropologists you know, usually would study what, what people call, you know, the, the little traditions or, uh, you know, indigenous peoples or um, people in, in remote places. But um, that's, that's sort of a stereotype of what anthropology does. Anthropology also, I mean, it's just the study of humanity. That's literally what anthropology means. Um, anthropos, the study of the human. And so, um, I, what I wanted to do when I began my PhD in anthropology was think about uh, this institution of the police, um, and uh, which of course many people conceive as you know a, a very powerful and many people feel hyper empowered or too powerful institution. So I thought that I was going to be, as I said, studying up. Um, and uh, I wanted to try to understand also what it meant to inhabit or, or to live and work uh, as, as a police officer, um, you know, in, in this authoritative position and, you know, you know how, how you conceive your social role, how, how you see the world. Um, and I did start out uh, both in 2004 and later when I came back in 2006, I began speaking mostly with IPS officers like yourselves. Um, and uh, eventually I did make my way to uh, a rural Tana outside of Lucknow, um, where I spent the better part of a year and a half just observing, you know, everyday life. Um, so I could get a sense of the more, you know, the, the cutting edge uh, police life. And, um, and the more time that I spent there, not only at the Tana, but with, with officers of various ranks all over UP, um, the more I started receiving these kind of mixed messages about what it means to be an authoritative figure or to have police power or authority. Uh, it became much more patchy and uncertain and questionable um, and I thought I'd perhaps just show you uh, a few pictures, if I can, I'll, I'll screen share. Um, you know, when I came in 2004, and some of you, if you are in the UP cadre, uh, you might uh, remember this. Can everyone see this okay? Um, this, is, this is just a few, can everyone see the slides? Um, when I came in, in 2004, I was just having these, again, just initial conversations. I was just kind of getting to know, you know, even the, the ranking structure, laws and regulations and things, just very basic knowledge. Um, and I was speaking with a number of IPS officers and actually the, I, at the SSP at the time, I had an appointment to uh, meet with him. But when I, when I called uh, to have my appointment, he said, I'm so sorry, uh, we, we can't meet today law and order situation. <laughs> I said, oh, oh, okay. Uh, and as the day went on, and um, I see Bella Chandra be smiling, you may remember this from the book, 
this is actually the first image uh, that I, uh, it's, I, I actually have it as a figure in the book. This was the headline from that, well, the next day of what had happened. Um, now, some of you, again, if, especially if you're in the UP cadre or in maybe the Tamil Nadu or some other states where there have been these clashes between um, district police and lawyers, this, this may be a, a familiar thing. So there was, there was um, you know, essentially, I think there had been a car accident, um, a minor accident, but it erupted into, in front of the high court and it erupted into a fight between the police and, um, and the, the public prosecutors there. Uh, and I learned later that this wasn't even the first time that such a, a kind of riotous event had happened, but it affected, I mean, traffic stopped all over the city. It was, and I was, you know, here, here I was just a graduate student saying, whoa, what, what is this? You know, a, 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 they call it a tiff in this headline, but uh, I mean, it, it was, it was pretty much a full, and it, it happened, it broke out all over the city. So I said, what, what is going on here? Um, and even more interesting, you know, as, as time went on and I, I read more of the stories, I have some close ups here. I became very interested in the way that the police were being represented in, uh, in the journalistic portrayals of what had happened. Um, you know, for example, we would see, you know, you, we would certainly see, you know, the pictures of the Lati charge and all of that, but we would also see pictures like this, you know, here's a lawyer who's coming and, and beating uh, one of the traffic police um you know this too this one back here you have you know the the head of the Awad bar association who's named and just a cop an unnamed constable you know who's looking kind of weak and, and injured so you know in this moment um i said huh you know the, the the police are not appearing to be very powerful or authoritative at all indeed it seems like their authority is not only being questioned but in this particular case overrun um, and, you know, and, and this incident, it's not, it's, again, it's not unique, I think, in, in what it reveals about, um, I think, a kind of inversion, uh, you know, that many people assume that police are, are hyper-empowered, but there are these moments and ways, and you know better than anyone, where you, you know, where police will feel very, very disempowered. Um, and so I saw other examples of this. Um, uh, some of you may remember uh, this unfortunate incident where a deputy SP uh, was at a checkpoint and some uh, five young men who claimed they had a, a relative in the Samajwadi party, which was in power at the time, uh, just said, no, we're not going to stop at the checkpoint. And they just rushed through and um, the, the DSP actually, you know, he had to grab onto the hood of the, the bonnet of the car and was driven around. It was a very humiliating um, moment. Uh, a spectacle. Uh, I did actually later interview Officer Sahni uh, at one point while doing my research and was very sorry actually to learn uh, some years later that he, he died by suicide. And I think this is another major issue, one that remains quite taboo um, and something that we need to think about and talk about much more deeply, um, police uh, suicide, uh, and also the many um, just resignations from the job, people who who quit. Um, I, I think maybe some people in the IPF in the foundation can correct me, but I think the government still does not track uh, in any comprehensive way uh, either police suicide specifically or uh, the number of resignations per year. But if somebody has that data, please let me know because I'd really like to to track that. So, so you know, while you know throughout this period. You know, while I was doing um, the longest part of my research, I would keep seeing headlines <laughs> like this. And this is Times of India. You know, you, you may have your opinions about various <laughs> news outlets. And, but, you know, it was just, there were just these constant sort of, um, you know, ways in which police were belittled. So not just, they were not presented as this big, powerful force, but rather as, you um, as people who were themselves insecure and being attacked. Oh, yeah, this, this was, you know, another one. Cops are unsafe in the state capital of, of Lucknow. Um, so, and I'm, I'm, you know, and we've all heard the, the discourses about Gundaraj and, and blaming the, the political parties. But I mean, what I'm more interested in, in thinking about is 
Um, you know, what all of these kinds of things say about larger structures of how police authority actually works or, or what it even is. Um, and I, again, I saw so many things, you know, like what, what are portrayed in, in these pictures um, in my own observations as well, um, you know, that went, that, that were not spectacular or that went unreported. Uh, and so over time, it seemed to me like the, you know, the district police in UP were, you know, they were being beaten back as much as they might beat down on others. And, you know, I struggled to, to explain this, um, you know, the, the inconsistencies that one observes in police authority um, and what often I think would sometimes manifest uh, as, as impotence. So, over time, um, I began to consider the, you know, the restricted and the very contingent character of police authority as like, like a shifting social field. So again, a, a set of forces and relations that um, both reflect, but also reproduce particular elements of social order, including but not limited to things like inequality um, uh, and, you know, various kinds of, of power asymmetries and, of course, uh, you know, communal fractures and, and things like this. And so in reconsidering the motivations and the moralities and the meanings and, and the abilities of you know police as presumably powerful actors i came to this idea of thinking about police authority as provisional which again is as balachandran d mentioned the the title of the book so and when i say provisional authority i mean that police authority is provisional in at least three different senses the first sense has to do with both, you know, um, a time and space bound um, sense of, you know, basically a particular moment in a particular location. Police might have authority there, um, but they may not have it in another time and space. So just, you know, the idea that authority will vary, it will fluctuate in different contexts or different times and places. Um, the second sense of what I mean by police authority being provisional is that it is very much linked with resource allocation or, you know, the ability to provide, uh, provisional also means to provide resources for the self and for, you know, for the police themselves, but also for others. And this too, right, this ability to, to serve, right? To, to provide protection or to provide information um, or even an FIR or, or something. You know, the, this too, it, it, the ability to do that varies, right? Um, it might depend on, on your, your rank or, you know, on decisions made by judges or the, of course the political party in power. Um, so again, this, this idea of flux but specifically flux in the ability to provide something. And third, I, I argue that police authority is provisional in a, in a moral sense as well, um, in the sense that there are contingent understandings of what is right or what is wrong, again, depending on the circumstances of a case, right? So considering police authority as, as being shaped by these, you know, variables and this constantly, you know, fluctuating set of, of practices and understandings, um, you know, it, it helps us think about also what constitutes a good, right? Not just good in the moral sense as in good versus bad, but, you know, when we talk about goods or delivering goods, right, delivering service, delivering provisions, um, you know, we, we really have to rethink very common practices, um, whether it's, uh, you know, the way a criminal investigation proceeds, uh, the way evidence is presented, um, 
or in some cases even fabricated. Um, perhaps, you know, um, the IO or the SHO chooses not to file an official report at all. Uh, it can be very difficult sometimes for investigating officers to distinguish perpetrators from victims or to arbitrate disputes. So as I argue toward the end of the book, this framework of the provisional, of police authority being provisional, I think it can help us perhaps to rethink or we reframe some of the things that I call in the book, the usual suspects of what people often just assume is police malpractice or you know, either not doing the job or, or doing you know, anything from excessive force or you know, discrimination uh, to also things like the bureaucratization and good old corruption, you know, always part of the discourse in, in India as well. And I also think that, you know, thinking about authority as provisional can also help us reconsider what security even means and, you know, what the state security apparatus, which of course the police is, is central to, you know, how, how that can work, you know, and also the way that police are, I think, very interestingly, at the same time, you know, that you may be valorized, you know, you're, you're also vilified for precisely the things that people are demanding of you. So there's this paradox in the way that police become, you know, heroes and martyrs on the one hand, but, you know, demons and, and criminals even on, on the other in, in public consciousness and how people think about you about the police and and what you do, so I'll I'll just wrap up. Um, I think I'm I'm about at time here. Um, maybe I could I mean I mean just quickly. I, each chapter addresses a different theme. So in in the I mean in the introduction, I just kind of you know give a general sense of of UP and the structure and all all the things that you all already kind of know about the police institution, its history, but. Uh, in the first chapter after this, chapter two, which I call uh, corruptible virtue, um, what I do is I try to consider things that from the outside just look like corruption. But I, I use the lens of, of Jugad Karna, right, to do Jugad, um, and thinking about that as a, as a way of adapting um, to circumstances that are largely beyond one's control. So um, you know, whether it's taking shortcuts in an investigation, taking bribes even, or gifts, um, you know, in some way, some of these practices, I say, can be understood as just being resourceful, just trying to get the job done, right, um, under circumstances of scarcity and often lack of support from uh, the government. In the, the next chapter, which I call Orderly Ethics, I look at the way that, again, very common, routine, everyday practices at the Tana. Um, so again, things like uh, conflict resolution, deciding whether to take cognizance of a case, um, you know, inquiries versus investigations. You know, I look at the decision-making processes of the SHO or um, and, and investigating officers um, and how, you know, basically how they think they are doing their duty um, and justify making certain kinds of decisions in line with what they think is, again, both reasonable in terms of what's, what resources are available to them and, and also, you know, what is right, what is just, who needs help the most. Um, so I, I, I think about that also in terms of the many, many, many pressures that are um, being visited uh, on police, you know, both top down from, from the boss, but also bottom up, you know, from the people coming and making complaints, making demands, um, you know, be they poor villagers, uh, influential, you know, local big men, um, even, even officers, you know, personal associates and family members, uh, to say nothing of the law itself. Um, and so in the next chapter, what I talk about is, is titled Expendable Servants. 
uh, which I, I consider this kind of the beating heart of the book in many ways. So this really, this thinks about how police, especially again, rank and file cutting edge police uh, are routinely called upon by powerful elites, the political classes or, or others, um, specifically to, to use their power, to use their authority, um, to use force as needed um, as, a, as a kind of service. Um, so this chapter also looks at how, it's not just about how police might have to use force, but also how violence and stress gets visited upon police themselves. And indeed, this is the thread that really guides my current work, which is uh, related primarily to the way that cutting edge police are themselves trying to organize around grievances related to the job so that they might improve their living and working conditions. And the last substantive chapter, which is probably most, you know, something that uh, is perhaps the most familiar or most relevant to this group, uh, focuses on the politics of postings and transfers and the way that, of course, it can be a reward, it can be a punishment. Um, but what I'm most interested in is how officers, especially senior officers like yourselves, you know, try to manage your professional trajectory and feel some sense of control over the course of your career and how where you get posted. So all of this amounts to, I think, in some ways you could say it's the way that police themselves feel insecure and, and need more of a sense of both professional but also personal security that can hopefully then feed back into the work that they do. And that's really what you know I'm trying to do here with this book is to, to sit with police, um, understand your worldview, um, and you know, represent how complex the job is and how people are doing their best to make sense of their social role and deploy what authority you, know, you do have, <laughs> uh, hopefully toward just ends. So I think I've already taken up too much time. So I would be very happy now to hear from all of you. And thank you again so much for the opportunity to be here. I see a lot of questions there on the chat so maybe balachandran do you yeah, can help yeah. me navigate this thank you very much uh, beatrice uh, i like a particular if you may permit i'll like to read one sentence which uh, which in my opinion is the crux of the whole police problem i will after reading this out i'll come to the questions there are a number of questions very good questions which are there now i find that on page 156, you have mentioned the, as I explicated throughout this text, for all the promised benefits and the supposed security of government employment, police life and work are also characteristic, characterized by extreme insecurity, not just from occasional danger of interacting with criminalized elements, but more pointedly from the signs of the provisionality of their state authority, particularly the slow violence of their own welfare, being ignored by the very state they represent and serve producing vicious cycles of inability, instability, inequity, and inequity. I found it the crux of the whole book is this, why the police are not able to perform as the public expects. Now, uh, I will now deal with some of the questions which are uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Diru Mishra has uh, said, according to you, what is more problematic, the indeterminate nature of police authority or inconsistencies in police leadership? It's a very good question. Mm. That's a good question. Um, yeah, so first we just, I should make sure we, do. so inconsistencies in leadership, um, I, I hope I'm right in assuming that means just the fact that it's very often changing, um, but also that means that whoever, you know, whoever the boss is at a certain time, I remember one, um, 
I'm not sure I'll name it, but one, one assistant to the DGP that I spoke with in UP some time ago said, show me the rule, show me the man and I'll show you the rule, right? That, you know, it just depends on who's in a particular post at a particular time and they make the decisions. And so I, I think that that's what you mean by inconsistency in leadership. But then when I talk about this other thing of indeterminate authority, which is not about, it's not linked to a particular individual, but just, um, it's more about, I think, how people read police, you know, or, or how, how a common member of the public, you know, responds. It's a great question because I think both, I, I wouldn't say one matters more than the other, but that they really, those two things, the inconsistency in leadership and the indeterminacy or the indeterminate nature of authority broadly of the institution, um, you know, they, they kind of feed back into each other, right? I mean, since people see inconsistency, they don't even know what to think often. Again, there's, there's just so much confusion. And I think confusion, in addition to lack of provisions, as Balachandranji just highlighted, the fact that, you know, the police institution itself is often not given what it needs by the government, the, the state government, that you know, that, that has the power to make decisions about not just budgets, but vacancies, you know, everything, that those are the things that there's just not a, a broad vision. There's often just a lack of an overarching strategic plan and, and set of goals um, that, that everyone can collaborate on. Um, so I hope that goes some way in answering the question, which is a very good one. Thank you. The next uh, question is by, rather, there are two questions here. Mr. Arvind Verma, uh, he has asked, uh, you have seen and heard and interviewed a variety of officers and have shown the ugly face of policing in the country. My question is, is there something commendable, something positive that you also find in the police? I think uh, she has also answered, anyway, I would like uh, Beatrice to answer this. Second question is with reference to P.A.G. Waddington, you have worked with him, defending the British police on charges of in institutional racism, leveled by McPherson Commission. He said that all the racist comments and other events by officers largely canteen culture. I don't know what is canteen culture. Anyway, among themselves, the talk is designed to give purpose and meaning to inherently problematic in your occasional experiences. He summarizes, there is little relationship between privately expressed views of officers and their actual behavior outside. The question is, does your ethnological study refute Waddington's thesis or his analysis applies only to British or Western police, not media? Okay. Um, so maybe then I'll I'll take that. I don't know, do, you, do I need to Clarify the question. I'm not really sure whether I think there were some spelling mistakes there. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I generally understand. But yeah, I mean, of course, Waddington was was speaking about the British colonial era, right? And canteen culture. Um, and no, 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 it is a fairly recent uh, uh, article with uh, you know. Uh, is I mean, it okay? Last week. No, uh, uh, maybe I have to check uh, when it was published. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's uh, 1999, so about 20 years ago. Yeah. And he's okay. talking yeah. about you know what what officers say in private uh, right. does not translate that. And incidentally, he also describes the British police, uh, what he calls a socially powerful organization, to be very fragile, and that's why he says there's a kind of indifference. So I was wondering whether. Uh, you would accept it or challenge it or how would you interpret that? Well, I think one interesting way to think about that, um, which uh, actually comes from a comparative case in ethnography of police in South Africa by Julia Hornberger. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with her work. So she did something very similar to me, but in South Africa. And she, she has this idea of sort of front stage and backstage in thinking about, and she, she was attending specifically to the ways uh, in which 
uh, police there in South Africa incorporate global discourses of human rights. So that was her focus. But, but this front stage backstage idea, um, which reminds me a lot of what you're describing here as, as Waddington's thesis, which is that, you know, so there, there's what happens publicly and officially and on paper, and then there's what happens, you know, in the canteen or, you know, whatever space where it's, it's more private. Uh, I mean, certainly, I think, yes, to some extent there, you know, there's, <laughs> there's always going to be a public face and then a behind the scenes set of, of dynamics and, and such. Um, but I don't know if that necessarily, I mean, it's, it certainly doesn't explain everything. I mean, I'm not sure what he, I mean, if we take that to its its logical conclusion um, or, or what, I mean, it's sort of like, okay, so what? Like, yes, there's a front stage and a backstage, but then, you know, the question is, well, does that mean that it's all false? No, not necessarily. I mean, in any institution, you know, you're going to have, um, you know, not just for reasons, well, often for reasons of confidentiality, but also just for kind of pragmatics of, of getting things done, you know, there will be yeah, there are going to be things that that won't come out in public, but I, I don't know. I wouldn't say I'm refuting it or 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 supporting it. It's just I think that is a social fact that there there can be this distinction, but I don't think that has to necessarily mean that the public face can never be trusted or can never be believed um, if, if that's the assumption. And so, kind of to go to the first question uh, about you know, is there something commendable or, or, or positive. I, there were many things I found. I think I was probably most impressed when I observed in 2007, um, the, the police management of the Ard Kumbh Mela in uh, Allahabad in that year. I mean, it, I, you know, when you have a four, first of all, that there was, they were sorely, sorely under-resourced. I mean, I think the BBC reported that there were 20,000 police on the ground. The number was something like half that. Uh, you know, the SSP who, who was put in charge, he got, he got the assignment, I want to say like two months before he had to start, he was terrified. Um, but, but he, he pulled it off and they all did as a team. And I, I mean, it was, it was one of the most impressive things I have ever seen, you know, managing tens of millions of people coming through this tiny place and, and you know, with hundreds of thousands of missing persons reports and thefts, thefts reported, um, but it it all went relatively smoothly. There was there was no major stampede or anything that year. Uh, now that's a major mass scale event, but even on a much more, you know, everyday small scale kind of thing, yeah, I, I would see you know constables and SOs managing, you know, stopping children from bullying and and really you know listening to to people who, who came, who had the courage to come to the Tana to report uh, whatever, you know, was ailing them and, and they would be responsive. So, I mean, really I think policing is about relationships. And I think many, many of the police that I worked with and, and observed, you know, they, they did really care about what they were doing and, and, you know, tried their best with what they had. So I'd say that's commendable, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think we have only about 10, May? 12 minutes uh, left. Uh, yeah, Prakash, uh, please. We have only 12 minutes left. Uh, I'm Prakash Singh here. Uh, Beatrice, first of all, I must compliment you for uh, what I thought was a very realistic uh, presentation of facts about UP police. I myself have been Director General Police UP. Uh, that was uh, well before you did your study uh, in 19... Uh, I mean, 1991 90, to 93. So, I mean, it's a it's really a very realistic presentation. And I, as I was saying before, you joined the discussion. Some of you, you have such deep inside knowledge. You have acquired such deep inside knowledge about Indian police that you qualify to join us. I mean, as a serving police <laughs> officer. <laughs> Having said that, I mean, coming now to the point, uh, you see. I was first, uh, when I read about provisional authority, I was a little perplexed. Why do you call it provisional? Because uh, this thing has stayed on uh, from 1861 to the present day. So, I mean, it has uh, all the trappings of almost a permanent institution. And even the Supreme Court has not been able to change it. 
they gave directions uh, which remain largely unimplemented and whatever implementation has been done is more on paper than on the ground. So it has continued for, uh, I mean, since 1960. So you can say, it, it, I mean, it, it is not provisional. It's almost a permanent thing. But uh, you explain what you mean by a provisional that in terms of time and space, in terms of resources, in terms of moral authority, all that. So my question would be, uh, A, uh, which, which other countries, uh, I mean, you must have studied several other countries. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of things common everywhere. I mean, the fabrication of evidence, use of torture, excessive force. Uh, I mean, you have encountered yeah, killing. You have killing of blacks in USA. So, I mean, all these things are happening across the country. Uh, but uh, you analyze what is that? What needs to be done to sort of bring about a transition from the trans from the provisional to a permanent. Uh, uh, structure for the police so that uh, the working gets institutionalized and the context the, in terms of time and space doesn't uh, affect the working of the police. It, it As an institution, it continues to function the same way, irrespective of who is uh, uh, in authority uh, politically. Uh, resources, of course, uh, that is an easy point. Resources, Government of India is also giving, and I think uh, uh, we uh, I mean, in terms of resources, we may still be under-equipped and under-resourced, but things are moving forward. But uh, there is something else which needs to be done, which has not been done. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, you have come to this uh, conclusion that it's uh, some kind of a provisional authority because the authority keeps on changing. Uh, the, I mean, the political leadership, uh, I mean, the political complexion or the leadership at the police, uh, uh, I mean, at the top of the police hierarchy, that brings about changes which give it a, uh, in the nature of a, uh, as you, what you call a provisional authority. So what needs to be done? What, I mean, I wish, uh, I know it's not part of the book, but would you like to <clears throat> make some brief observations on uh, making this transitional or provisional authority uh, sort of a permanent institutionalized uh, structure? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I guess the first thing I would say is, because I mean, it really sounds like an of course, this is not surprising coming from you, you know, you're really interested in what, like, what is to be done, right? What, how can we reform things so that, you know, they can get better? And it sounds like you're also asking, how can we make authority not provisional? I don't know if that's actually possible. And so, and the other thing I would say first is that I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that, uh, that police authority is provisional because what what the positive side of that, obviously there are a lot of negatives, but the positive side of that is that because it's it's not rigid and and then there is flexibility and adaptability built in, I think what we really need to think about is how can we use that structure um, of, you know, in which we are going to fill in the content depending on the context, you know, how can we use that in a way to to do the best job, right? To, to do what's right. Because I don't think there's gonna be one, uh, like a one size fits all, um, you know, set of reforms. And I, I do think that the PIL that you brought forward and the Supreme Court decision that came down and everything that's followed from that. I mean, you're right, not enough. It hasn't come nearly close enough uh, to those directives, you know, I think in many places, in many states, you know, to, to make a, a substantive difference, but it has made some difference. So, for, you know, to you, I would say it's, it's you know, there, there has been change um, in, in some places, and I don't have to summarize all of that for you, but um, I, I do think that, you know, the, the usefulness in some ways of thinking about police authority as provisional is that we can say, okay, like what is, in whatever state, whatever cadre you're in, you know, wherever you are, uh, and even in whatever posting you're in, if you're, you know, the law and order DGP or, you know, or if you're a district SP or a zonal IG, whatever your post, you, you say, okay, like, this is what I, this is where I am. This is what I have available to me. Uh, you know, what, and who knows how long I'm going to be in the post, but, you know, what can I do with my time here, with the resources available to me to, to really give the most and, and do the best job I can. And provisionality allows that, that the fact that things are fluctuating and, and contingent, you know, it, it, it can be a benefit. So it may not be the answer that you're looking for or satisfying, but it's, I mean, that's what I think. I think that, you know, you just kind of have to 
do the best. That, that's what that, there's the beauty to Jugad too, right? That you can really make something good with what you have. Thank you. Sir, can I come Thank in, you. sir? I'm sir. Opi Mishra, sir. Hello? Can I come okay. in, sir? Yeah, please, yes. Uh, I think I've written my question also, sir. What Professor Betris has actually tried to explain how the provisional authority in a police organization like UP gets reflected in the behavioral and response dimension in day-to-day -day policing. Now, my basic question is that, don't you think that some of these issues which you have highlighted also gets reflected in different form and nature in other police organizations in the world? You see, what has happened to Met Police Commissioner who had to resign because of a lot of issues related to the, uh, and there were a lot of uh, controversies. Similarly, this needs to be also seen in the backdrop what happened in George Floyd's uh, case where even defunct police in a state, I mean, in, in a country like USA, this came up. So what kind of, I mean, do you think that UP is what is in isolation or do we have reflections of some of these behavioral and response dimensions while exercising the authority, which you say provisional authority is also prevalent in other uh, countries. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. Absolutely. And it, it echoes um, the other part of um, Mr. Prakash Singh's question about other other places and policing in other parts of the world. I Yes, and indeed, that's what um, by, by the end of the book, that's what I'm trying to argue that this this concept, what we can think of as a framework for thinking of police authority as provisional, it I, no, I don't think it's unique to UP at all. I think it's something that we can see. Again, it, it, it might look a little different in, in, in a different state in India or in a place like the US or Canada or London, you know, the, the UK, whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it, especially the part of provisionality where I talk about, you know, contingency um, and, you know, in, in a way it's conditional. Your authority is conditional on whatever resources are at hand, who's in the position, how the people are responding. And yes, that's going to be true of policing, I think, anywhere in the world. And I mean, part of what um, I want to say here also is that, you know, like as someone here pointed out, like, you know, journalists and many people, they, they'll say, you know, that like policing in India, it often gets a pretty bad rap. Policing in everywhere gets a bad, a bad rap, right? Um, and I think that's because people just don't, really understand the the challenges and complexities of what the everyday life and and decision making process you know entails and and, and what happens so um, I mean the short answer is is absolutely that I think a lot of what we see a lot of what I describe and try to explain in the book uh, can be seen in many many parts of the world thank you there are about uh, five, six more questions. Uh, do we have the time for taking up all these or uh, are we closing down at 7 p.m.? Ramchandra. Sir, would you like to uh, choose one or two questions and then okay, okay. provisionally yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> give a five minutes extension to the, uh, to the discussions? Five minutes, seven minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. And I'm also, for what it's worth, I'm also happy to, you know, people can send me questions later too if we don't get to it right now. There is a question here. How relevant is psychometric test and is necessity to get integrated while recruiting a police officer at Indian police keeping your provisional authority in mind for the 20th century police? Hmm. Psychometric testing, yeah, that's, um, that's something I know exists. I didn't look specifically at things like the test questions and how that works, but maybe uh, Mr. Bajpai, do you wanna say a bit more about the test itself and what, uh, it sounds like you're critical of it or thinking maybe it's not needed, but I'm not sure 
if I'm reading that right. So um, if he wants to add a little bit, hello? Oh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, like uh, re while recruiting in the Indian Armed Forces, the, there is a process of psychometric test. I am uh, in a form of uh, uh, getting a psychometric test, but uh, at uh, recru while recruiting of a police officer uh, in, the, in the Indian police officer, uh, in the Indian police, so, <clears throat> so uh, uh, will a psychometric test also help to uh, you know dynamize uh, uh, like. Uh, uh, like it really shows how you behave in a certain situation or a certain uh, you know so your uh, natural reaction so uh, will 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 integrating a psychometric test uh, while uh, you know while the in the recruiting process help uh, to build the relationship between a, a police officer and the uh, and the uh, uh, kind of service he's putting to the people. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, because I always thought of, and again, this is another something that, I mean, I know my brother at one point was thinking about going into policing and he had to take a, a, psych a psychological test. Um, so it, it seems like, yeah, it's just one of those things that's that's part of the process. But the idea is that it's as you just said, like it's it's testing, like how would this person respond? Like, would they be the right kind of person to become a police officer, right? So it's it it sounds like it's it's supposed to be a gauge for, um, you know, are we are we recruiting the right kind of people? Um, and I, yeah, I mean that's I think in there's a lot to think about there, especially when it comes to. Um, you know, again, the rank and file and, and the cutting edge and the way that I, I sometimes hear uh, people rationalizing or, or um, trying to explain, you know, poor performance or, you know, when, when there are, I don't know, say controversies or, or moments when it seems like the police are not performing as people would want you know, I'll sometimes hear people say things like, oh, we just can't find the right kind of people, right, to become police. And, you know, I think that's a very, um, it, it's problematic in, in some ways. Like, what does it even mean? What is the right kind of person <laughs> to be, to become a police officer? What does that even mean? And how, you know, it, it can sometimes be used, I think, to to blame people or to say, you know, like, oh, well, they shouldn't have been a police officer in the first place. And so that's the problem, right? Is it? Or are there other problems, which which this does tie back to the issue of, poli of provisionality, um, specifically the part where the government is supposed to provide for the police? Um, you know, I sometimes think that, um, you know, police officers themselves get blamed um, for, you know, a particular outcome or, you know, like the, the, the way something happens when it's, it's not the individual officers or even the decisions that they make that are the problem, but these much larger structural problems of, you know, the politicization of, of policing, of, of government, you know, governance generally. And, and again, the, the way that resources, you know, get allocated or get held back, um, perhaps when they're needed. So, you know, psychometric testing, like you're asking about, that's, it's kind of an entree, I think, into thinking about, yeah, well, what, what are the things, who, who's being blamed for the problems? Are the police officers themselves being blamed? And is that the right thing? Or should it be that we, you know, we should be thinking much more largely about, again, things like, um, structures of, of resource allocation, visions um, for, you know, reform and, and policy changes. Um, I hope that makes some sense. It, it, it's, it's very interesting, I think, to think through these kinds of issues of, you know, who becomes a police officer, why, but then what happens to you as, you know, you move through the job, um, like how do you change? Because uh, a psychometric test can only tell you so much at the beginning of you know who that person was or the kinds of responses they have before they become a police officer. But what I think we also really need to think about is what does becoming a police officer do to you? 
how does it how does it change you what do you have to do to adapt to that position i'm afraid uh, i may have to stop the questions now because it's almost uh, five minutes past uh, 8 p.m uh, i'm supposed to do the summing up uh, i can only say that we had very useful discussion i'm so sorry that uh, some of the good questions were not uh, could not be taken up i would be grateful if uh, beatrice could kindly uh, if if you could uh, uh, we can send it to you if yeah. you could kindly reply uh, either individually or to the police foundation i'll just take one minute to round up so we had discussed various problems that uh, we encounter now one thing which we have forgotten with the course of work is uh, i wanted to draw your attention to today's economic times in india there is a title called end regulatory brutality now it's a, it's a very very sensational uh, strategy they have given we have and the the the, uh, the article is jail for doing business now this impacts our reputation the police reputation and uh, 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 you know and and our own uh, goodwill to the, towards the public so what it says is that it lists 26134 imprisonment clauses this is not in the indian penal code or in local acts or anything like that these are the various business laws and it lists about 26134 imprisonment clauses in indian business law it may not the police may not come directly affected by this but it, there it does because if there is a law and order problem to implement these things the police are called so this is an additional duty now i also while writing my book uh, keeping it as safe in 2017 i did a research on the website of the bombay high court i was shocked to find that the police have implemented nearly 136 important central acts this is not indian police code in uh, in indian penal code or other other thing but the, what is called minor acts and 565 maharashtra acts how do we get the manpower for this this is a staggering burden and uh, you know this is this is something which uh, the police reforms uh, the people uh, like mr prakash singh and uh, ramchandran also should pay attention to uh Ramchand, would you like to propose a word of thanks, or uh, is this enough that I thank uh, Beatrice for taking her time and uh, and uh, you know and attending to all our questions and giving us an excellent presentation of her for excellent book. Thank you, sir. And uh, I mean, uh, we did not budget any time for a formal word of thanks, but then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Beatrice. Thank you, Mr. Balchandran, and Mr. Prakash Singh for blessing us all, and every one of the those present in the audience and those who uh, sent in questions. And what I will do is, I I truly apologize for not being able to find time to post these questions to Beatrice here. But then I promise that these questions will be. uh you know collected collated and sent to beatrice with a request that she may please uh send her brief responses so that i will have them circulated to all those who joined today so that everyone is in the loop so thank you so much uh everyone for making this uh, day truly useful and thank you beatrice for leading the discussions thank you sir mr prakash singh for being here and uh, mr balchandran and every one of you there thank you